Hello everyone, welcome to Study IQ. In this lesson, we'll discuss all the last one year current affairs of environment. This is part five of Environment Current Affairs series. This will be immensely beneficial for all those who are appearing for UPSC Prelims 2017. I am Bhumika Saini. I have done my engineering from NIT Jaipur. Study IQ has launched various pen drive courses for SSC examination, for banks examination, other government examination, and UPSC pen drive will be launched very soon on 1st June 2017. So the environment current affairs has been bifurcated into various section. First is uh, in the part one, we have discussed about all the issues related to pollution. In part two, we had discussed all the uh, current affairs related to the endangered species and efforts related to their conservation. Then in part three, we have discussed about uh, issues related to climate change. And uh, in part four, we have discussed all the conventions and organizations. And in part 5, we'll be discussing all the important days and reports. Plus, we'll cover miscellaneous section, uh, section as well in this particular lesson. So, let's start with the important days and events that were in news. First is World Environment Day. Now, this day is observed on 5 June every year. This day celebrates natural environment and it allows a global platform to raise awareness on environment issues worldwide. So uh, also the plans related to mitigation of these issues as a global community are also laid down. 2016 theme was go wild for life. So that is zero tolerance for illegal trade in wildlife and African country Angola. It was the host country which seeks to safeguard environment as it continues to rebuild after more than a a uh, quarter century of civil war so this is this was the host country in 2016 this environment day is observed globally by unep that's an organization it was established uh, in 1972 only during this uh, uh, stockholm conference i have told you this in part four when this uh, unep was uh, formed then un general assembly designates june 5 why june 5 is designated as world environment day because this june 5 was the first day of the landmark Stockholm Conference on Human Environment in 1972. Okay, then theme for 2017 is connecting people to nature uh, in the city and on land from poles to the equator. So connecting people to nature and the host country will be Canada. So this year the host country will be Canada. Last year the host country was Angola. So this is World Environment Day. And this was uh, go wild for life uh, that uh, that was the theme of world environment day now uh, world day to combat desertification this is observed on 17 june across the world to promote public awareness related to international cooperation to combat desertification plus the effects of drought so 2016 theme was inclusive cooperation for achieving land degradation neutrality so in order to curb this land degradation uh, inclusive cooperation is needed so that was advocated uh, in this 2016 theme okay it also advocates contributing towards achieving the overall sustainable development goals and 2016 slogan was protect earth restore land and engage people so it's it's actually advocating for cooperation plus participation in working towards achieving land degradation neutrality now un general assembly it has designated this june 17 as world day to combat desertification and drought first time in 1994 so in 1994 there was a convention to combat desertification uh, this com uh, this convention was signed in 1994 and that's why uh, this uh, june 17 has been declared as world day to combat desertification and uh, this day is observed globally to promote public awareness of the issue of desertification plus the implementation of UN convention to combat desertification in those countries which are experiencing severe des uh, de desertification or drought especially in Africa India also has this problem of desertification and drought so this was the theme protect earth this was a slogan protect earth restore land and engage people that is June 17 now another uh, day is world oceans day it was observed uh, it's observed globally on 8th june every year to raise awareness of current challenges that are faced by international community in connection to oceans now this day also seeks to provide unique opportunity to honor to protect and to conserve our oceans so 2016 theme was healthy oceans healthy planet because ocean uh, they they actually they play a great role in uh, in ensuring sustainable ecosystem 
they have huge biodiversity so the theme highlights uh, the urgent need to curb the menace of plastic pollution this was emphasized in 2016 un general assembly designated 8 june as world ocean day in 2008 and this day includes a variety of activities and actions such as special outdoor exploration beach cleanups educational and action programs to advocate uh, people to generate uh, awareness related to oceans and educational and action programs are conducted art contest uh, film festivals and sustainable seafood events so this was uh, 8th june that is world oceans day now there is another day that is world hydrography day so this is celebrated on 21st june it was adopted by international hydrographic organization as an annual celebration to publicize the work of hydrographers and importance of hydrography so this day emphasizes the importance of protection of marine reserves and promotion of safe navigation in international water and ports okay but first you should understand what is hydrography as such so this this hydrography is actually a branch of science which deals with measurement and description of physical features of ocean sea coastal areas lakes and rivers as well as uh, the prediction of the change of of their change over time so for the primary purpose of safety of navigation and in support of all other marine activities so in hydrography what we do we actually uh, measure and describe the physical features uh, within the ocean seas coastal areas lakes etc okay and this year theme in 2016 it was hydrography the key to well managed seas and waterways so this uh, hydrography it also helps in uh, in ensuring safety of navigation so it is uh, this theme was intended to promote the importance of hydrography internationally multilateral cooperation and effective collaboration in data exchange charting and standards development 2017 theme will be mapping our seas ocean and waterways more important than ever so this will be the theme this year the idea of observing a uh, world Hydro- Hydro- hydrography day was mooted by international hydrographic organization in 2005 and then it was officially instituted by un general assembly and the law of sea in 2005 okay so this is world Hy- Hy- uh, hydrography day we are mapping our uh, water bodies okay then there is international tiger day uh, this was also known as global tiger day it's observed annually on 29 july to raise awareness for tiger conservation so this is on 29 july mainly for uh, raising awareness for tiger conservation goal is to promote the protection and expansion of wild tiger habitat and to gain support through awareness for tiger conservation so many international organizations they are involved in uh, celebrating this day uh, that includes world wildlife fund for nature that includes ifaw that is international fund for animal welfare and likewise so international tiger day it was founded in 2010 so it started from 2010 at st peter's uh, berg tiger summit so this was a summit when this uh, day was de- designated the summit had issued st petersburg declaration on tiger conservation with an aim to double the cat population that is the tiger population by 2022 and you know india in india there is 70% of tiger population of the world is in india and there are total 13 tiger range con- uh, countries out of which one is india then bhutan nepal russia so uh, in these 13 countries uh, this uh, tiger uh, is found and out of which 70% of tiger population is india is in india so tigers are on the brink of extinction many factors have caused their numbers to fall including habitat loss hunting poaching climate change so india has also launched this project tiger in 1973 uh, mainly to uh, expedite the, the conservation efforts related to tiger conservation then there is a, wa- a water day the central government has decided to observe april 14 every year is water day and this is primarily because uh, uh, in recent times we have seen there have been a whole lot of issues related to water crisis uh, water is increasingly become a scarce resource with per capita availability of water going down to 1545 cubic meters as per the 2011 census as compared to 1816 cubic meter so the population is increasing plus the water availability is decreasing so that's why the per capita water availability is reducing the importance of economic use better management of water arises as most of the water is not available for use and secondly it is characterized by highly uneven spatial distribution so the water whichever whatever water is available Uh, that is uh, unequal unequal distribution is there plus uh, the water pollution is also a problem so it is not available for use so that's why uh, say april 14 uh, the government has decided to observe this as water day 
then there is international day for preservation of ozone layer now everything related to ozone layer uh, vienna convention montreal protocol has already been discussed in the uh, last uh, um, uh, like part 3 and part 4 Uh, so six, September sixteen, this is designated as UN uh, General Assembly. This was designated uh, uh, by UN General Assembly as International Day for Preservation of Ozone Layer. Why September sixteen? Because it was to commemorate the date that is in nineteen eighty seven, on which nations signed the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete ozone layer. So on this day, Montreal Protocol was signed. That's why, in order to commemorate. uh the the september 16 is designated as international day for preservation of ozone layer 2016 theme was ozone and climate restored by a world united and i told you that this uh, particular protocol is one of the most successful protocol and this is a protocol of vienna convention so international day for preservation of ozone layer is september 16 okay Uh, now there is another day that is World Food Day. World Food Day is observed globally on sixteenth October to mark foundation of FAO, that is Food and Agriculture Organization. This is a special agency of UN. So it aims to raise public awareness about hunger challenges, malnutrition challenges, and encourage people around the world to take action in fight against hunger. Theme for two thousand sixteen was climate is changing, food and agriculture must do. it highlights the issues of food security related to climate change so due to climate change there 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 is uh, this problem of food security also the the wheat belt the rice belt they, they, they may change uh, because of the climate change then the sea level rise may uh, may also lead to or may also affect the food security it calls adopting uh, sustainable practices for growing more food with less area of land and use resources wisely so this world food day 16th october and to mark foundation of fao then earth hour this very important this question has already been asked i think in 2014 or in 2015 the 11th edition of earth hour was observed across the world on 25th march 2017 so this year it was observed uh, observed on 25th march 2017 to take a global call on climate change to mark this day cities all over the world turn their lights off that is for one hour uh, all over the world the cities uh, they turn off their light for one hour that is off from 8:30 pm to 9:30 pm local time so it will vary from country to country because it is local time environmentalists uh, act environmental activist this year they focus to raise awareness on another problem that is light pollution so what are the problems related to light pollution we'll discuss in the next slide Earth Hour is an annual international event organized by World Wide Fund. Remember, it is organized by World Wide Fund for Nature. Earth Hour was held on March thirty one two thousand. The first Earth Hour was held in two thousand seven in Sydney in Australia. It is held annually in the end of March to encourage everyone to turn off their non essential lights for one hour. That is from eight thirty to nine thirty p.m. That is with respect to the local time in uh, different countries. Its goal is to raise awareness for sustainable energy use and create environment sustainable lifestyle. so uh, this year it was focused on light pollution so what is light pollution it's actually uh, an artificial uh, brightening of night sky and uh, it is also known as photo pollution so this uh, this light pollution it has a disruptive effect on natural cycles more than 80% of hum uh, humanity lives under skies saturated with artificial light so it it uh, it inhibits the observation of stars and planets it has a disruptive effect on natural cycle also it disturbs the reproductive cycle of some animals and also disturbs the migration of birds and nav uh, that navigate using stars because the the observation of stars and planets is inhibited so that's why the migration of birds that uh, navigate using these stars location that is also disturbed in humans it disturbs uh, uh, circadian rhythms that regulate hormones and other bodily function so if you see in humans it is affecting the hormones as well as other bodily function excessive blue light emitting from uh, leds directly affect the sleep pattern so it is also affecting sleep patterns it is affecting the hormones uh, and sleep patterns affected by suppressing the production of hormone melatonin which me uh, mediates the sleep sleep wake cycles in humans so you should understand what are the effects of light pollution first it affects the flora and uh, uh, 
birds especially the fauna uh, animals in animals what is the problem it affects the uh, migration of uh, birds it affects the reproductive cycle it uh, uh, in humans it is affecting the sleep pattern in humans it and they are affecting the hormones and it's it's different it's, dis, uh, it's disrupting the uh, natural cycles as such and it inhibits the observation of stars and planets so these are the main effects of light pollution and this year earth hour was mainly focused on uh, to raise awareness related to light pollution now there is another uh, day that is world tsunami awareness day it was observed uh, across the world on 5th november 2016 to spread awareness among people across the world about tsunami so the 2016 theme was effective education and evacuation drills because we, we cannot prevent a tsunami but yes we can manage the disaster so that uh, 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 like uh, the 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 loss of human life and property that is mitigated un general assembly has constituted the day by adopting a resolution in 2015 so this proposal of having a tsunami awareness day was first mooted by japan because japan is the country which is most uh, uh, like vulnerable to tsunami after the third un conference on disaster risk reduction in sendai in 2015 so out of this third conference this this uh, the the framework that was laid out is known as sendai framework sendai is a city in japan now the significance of this day that is the 5th november to uh, generate tsunami awareness can be traced back to year 1854 a villager in japan was concerned about impending tsunami after a high intensity earthquake on uh, november 5 1984 so that's why this is november 5 that is a world tsunami awareness day so this is uh, just a story related related to it that uh, that that person he set up a fire uh, to uh, inform the people uh, like uh, he went uh, atop to put up the fire and then he saved even as uh, tsunami destroyed their village down below so as such he tried to generate awareness that yes there can be an impending tsunami because there was an uh, there was a high intensity earthquake so this was the first documented instance of tsunami early warning following the devastating indian ocean tsunami that uh, we faced in on 26 december 2004 the government of india established an indian tsunami early warning system so we have it under this incois that is indian national center for ocean information service this is at hyderabad so this is a very important institution that is mainly looking uh, for the tsunami and early warning system so we have a uh, tsunami early warning system this is the tsunami uh, awareness day that is every year celebrated on or uh, observed on 5th november 2016 and mainly to spread awareness this year theme was effective education and evacuation drills now there is a world wet wetlands day ramsar convention we had discussed in the part 4 of environment uh, series uh, and i had told you that it was on 2nd february 1971 when the ramsar convention was signed so that's why on 2nd february every year world wetland day is observed it marks the date of adoption of convention on wetlands also called as ramsar convention on 2nd february 1971 and since then this day is observed every year to spread awareness about ramsar convention in particular for conservation of wetlands and i had told you how many uh, uh, this Ra- ramsar sites are there in india there are total 26 ramsar sites in india out of which two are in the montrex record 2017 theme was wetlands for disaster risk reduction and it seeks to raise awareness and highlight the role of healthy wetlands in reducing the impacts of extreme weather events so how wetlands can act or it can mitigate the disaster because um, they they act as a suction for floods uh, they help in control uh, they help in reducing the impacts of cyclones droughts on community and help in building disaster resilience theme for wetlands day 2016 was wetlands for our future sustainable livelihood so this year it was mainly focused on how wetlands can help in disaster risk reduction then there is a world wildlife day it is observed every year on 3rd march to celebrate and raise awareness about world's wild fauna and fo- uh, flora so why on 3rd march because to mark the adoption of sites this we have already discussed in part 4 convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora so world wildlife day was designated by unga uh, on 20 december 2013 this year the theme was listen to the young voices it aims to empower and engage the youth so listen to the young voices mainly uh, it aims to include or it it aims to promote the participation of youth in the conservation area so that's it that's what about a uh, world wildlife day on 3rd march and to mark the adoption of sites then there was a world sustainable development summit 
President uh, Pranam Mukherjee he inaugurated the first edition. Remember the first edition of World Sustainable Development Summit. It was inaugurated in New Delhi, and summit was organized by Teri, that is the Energy and Resource Institute. The theme was Beyond 2015: People, Planet, and Progress. So uh, this World Sustainable Development Summit has replaced Teri's earlier Delhi uh, Sustainable Development Summit. So earlier the name was this, but now uh, which was organized in 2005. But now uh, this is World Sustainable. Sustainable Development Summit. So the main aim of the summit is to provide various stakeholders a single platform in order to provide long-term solutions for the benefit of global community. It emphasized on need for business and private sector to lay to take lead in poverty reduction and to ensure rapid and sustained adoption of sustainable development goals. So it was mainly focusing on adoption of sustainable development goals, and it is organized by the Energy and Resource Institute. This was the first edition. What is this? The the Energy and Resource Institute. It's a non-profit research institute. Remember, it's a non-profit and research institute that conducts research in field of energy, environment, and sustainable development. So earlier it was uh, named as Tata Energy Research Research Institute. It was established in nineteen seventy four, but later it was renamed as the Energy and Research Institute in two thousand three. So it aims uh, to focus on formulating local and national level strategies. for shaping global solutions to critical issues so this is world sustainable development summit uh, organized in delhi by the energy and research institute so we have uh, discussed uh, various important days that were in news in last one year now let's discuss the important reports or any release so this birds of bunny grassland this uh, prime minister narendra modi he released a book titled birds of bunny grassland book was presented to prime minister by scientists of gujarat institute of desert ecology that is guide and it's a compilation of research work relating to more than 250 species of birds found in bunny grasslands of kutch gujarat so remember one thing is that bunny grassland is in kutch gujarat second this was a book that was released by the scientist of guide that is gujarat institute of desert ecology and this bunny grasslands are located in uh, gujarat this book is a compilation of research work relating to more than 250 species of bird so this um, guide it is located at bhuj it has been studying the plant bird and marine life in run of kutch for over 15 years so this was the uh, this uh, book that is the birds of bunny grassland so this was uh, how the prime minister has launched this book now uh, inheriting a sustainable world that is atlas on children's health and environment so this was recently released by who uh, uh, that is inheriting a sustainable world that's an atlas on children's health and environment polluted environment it kills around 1.7 million children a year so as per this report uh, polluted environment is one of the major cause for killing uh, children and this report it provides a comprehensive view of environment's impact especially air pollution on children's health so the most common cause includes diarrhea malaria and pneumonia due to pollution in fact harmful exposure it also increase the risk of premature birth and exposure to air pollution increases the lifelong risk of stroke heart disease and cancer so all this was uh, comprehensive comprehensively covered in this particular report released by world health organization then there was an endemic vascular plants of india uh this publication was released by botanical survey of india and it accounts for the highest number of flowering plants in india so the publication titled endemic vascular plants of india it revealed that almost one of every four species of flowering plants found in india is endemic to the country that is it is endemic to india so of these tamil nadu accounts for the highest number of species that is 410 followed by kerala and maharashtra so as per this it says that uh, most of the uh, flowering uh, plants that is one out of four they are found in india that is they are endemic to india and out of these tamil nadu has highest number of species then followed by kerala and then maharashtra in case of geographical distribution of endemic plants if you see western ghats it, it tops the list so western ghats is also one of the hottest uh, Uh, sorry it is one of the hot spot uh, of india and it is very high biodiversity so it tops the list with about 2116 uh, species followed by eastern himalayas with 4 466 species some of the plant species are restricted to only certain areas of country like insectivorous plants which is found only in khasi hills of meghalaya so this is a, a compilation or a publication released by botanical survey of india 
then this very important living planet report because uh, upsc in the past few years has been asking which report is released by which organization okay so you should remember this living planet report it is published every 2 years so it's a biennial report and it is published by world wildlife fund for nature since 1998 so it's a book or it's a report published biennially by wwf uh, that is world wildlife fund for nature it is based on living planet index and ecological footprint calculation so it's the world leading science based analysis on the health of our planet and impact of human activity so what does it study global wildlife uh, like as per this study global wildlife population have fallen by 58% since 1970 and if the trend continues so it's extrapolating that the, then the two thirds of wild animals may go extinct by 2020 study was published as living planet assessment by zoological society of london and world wildlife fund human activity including uh, like it's mainly uh, saying that these are the major causes habitat loss wildlife trade that is illegal uh, trade and poaching pollution climate change they are contributing to the decline in global wildlife population so this is the living planet report released by wwf and it mainly uh, focuses on why the this uh, world uh, uh, global uh, population of wildlife is decreasing and the major causes behind that okay then there is an energy efficiency implementation readiness so andhra pradesh has been ranked number 1 in world's bank energy efficiency implementation readiness so what you need to focus is that world bank it releases such index first thing second andhra pradesh has been ranked in this Uh, uh, rank number one in this. The ranking of the states were released in World's Bank study report. India state level energy efficiency implementation readiness. So Andhra Pradesh has topped it. Then Rajasthan, then Karnataka, and then Maharashtra. So these this is uh, related to World Bank energy efficiency implementation readiness. Now this is also important. India's biodiversity award two thousand sixteen. So uh, what is this biodiversity award? Let's first discuss this and who were the winners in two thousand sixteen. So this uh, biodiversity award it's a joint initiative of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, then National Biodiversity Authority and UNDP. So remember three uh, organization are uh, are actually involved. Joint initiative of M O E F, then. National Biodiversity Authority (NBA) plus UNDP. Okay, then the awards recognize the contribution of a range of stakeholders towards the conservation of biodiversity and excellence in biodiversity governance. So the four categories in which the award is given: conservation of threatened species, sustainable use of biological resources, successful mechanism model for access and benefit sharing, uh, biodiversity management community. And this year it was like last year it was given to. Uh, for the uh, uh, hornbill nest adoption program introduced in pakke tiger reserve in arunachal pradesh and then purnima devi barman and hargila army was for was given the award for protection of greater adjutant bird then uh, this uh, mock kainot sg for sustainable use of living roots bridge in meghalaya so this question was asked living roots bridge uh, in meghalaya this was asked uh, in upsc then in mp for involving local communities in developing medicinal plant dudai biodiversity management committee in uttarakhand for banning illegal sand mining and reviving river ecosystem so these were the awards that were given this year and remember uh, the joint initiative of moef undp and national biodiversity authority so pakke tiger reserve this is very important uh, first of all remember uh, it's located in the east kaming district and kaming river that is a tributary of uh, brahmaputra so this uh, pakke tiger reserve it, it flows uh, near this region Uh, sorry, Kaming uh, River. It flows near this uh, Pakke Tiger Reserve. It was earlier named as Pakui Tiger Reserve. It is adjacent to Nameri National Park in Assam and Sesa Orchid Sanctuary of Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary in Arunachal Pradesh. It is bounded by Pakke River and uh, this uh, Bareilly or Kaming River. Both are tributaries of Brahmaputra. So remember this Pakke Tiger Reserve. Generally, UPSC is fond of asking uh, questions related to uh, match the following like Tiger Reserve and the rivers which are uh, uh, like flowing through that. tiger reserve okay then there was another report that is report on animal and plant discoveries 2015 so this report was released by moef with the help of studies and experts of bsi botanical survey of india and zoological survey of india so what are the findings of these reports india's biodiversity has improved with 450 uh, 445 new species have been added to the list and it uh, it includes 262 animal species 183 plant species so reptiles amphibians uh, species of fish they have been included in the list 
and uh, most discoveries were made in the eastern himalayan region that is also a biodiversity rich region of india this accounts for 19% of total discoveries followed by western ghats and in andaman nicobar so animals like rock gecko found in chatisgarh new frog species from western ghats shiny new species of fish from western ghats so you can see western ghats region eastern himalayan region these are uh, all the biodiversity rich region of india plants new species of uh, uh, ginger uh, in the south garo hills of meghalaya this was found and a uh, species of mushroom collected from north sikkim at an altitude of 2829 meter so remember uh, the species this is important new species of ginger found in meghalaya okay then uh, let's discuss uh, because uh, i am covering uh, both the events like days reports plus the miscellaneous section in this lesson so we'll be discussing uh, issues related to disaster management then we'll shift to other miscellaneous topic so uh, national disaster management plan this is the first major national plan for disaster management that was uh, launched uh, recently the plan aims to make india disaster resilient and reduce loss of life so this has been made keeping in mind sindai framework and sustainable development goal remember i had told you earlier it was hugo framework then after hugo framework in 2015 uh, the sindai framework came both of them are for disaster management and uh, so this uh, plan this is the first plan that has been framed keeping in mind sindai framework and sdg major highlights of the plan include comprehensive definition of disaster so the definition of disaster has been comprehensively laid down the plan is based on four priority themes of sindai framework so these are the priority themes that is understanding the disaster risk improving the governance related to disaster risk investing in disaster reduction through structural and non structural measures disaster preparedness like early warning system building back better so better rehabilitation in the aftermath of disaster it covers all phases of disaster management prevention mitigation response and recovery and it covers human induced disaster also like chemical disaster nuclear disaster etc so uh, planning includes like planning for short term plus long run for 5 uh, years 10 years 15 years to deal with disaster so it's a very comprehensive plan now integrating approach with role clarity it provides for horizontal and vertical integration among all the agencies for better uh, coordination uh, the plan also spells out roles and responsibility of all levels of government right up to panchayat and urban local body in a matrix format so uh, that's what i told you horizontal and vertical integration of all the agencies department that are involved in it ministry ministries are given specific role for specific disaster for example ministry of earth science for cyclones then a plan has a regional approach which will beneficial not only for disaster management but also for development planning so it it also follows a regional approach and it is designed in such a way that it can be implemented in a scalable manner in all phases of disaster management so this is a very comprehensive very good and the first national uh, plan on disaster management that has been laid out in india major activities it identifies major activities such as early warning information dissemination medical care fuel transportation search and rescue evacuation as a checklist for agencies responding to disaster it also provides a generalized framework for recovery and flexibility to assess a situation and build back better so that the structure that are built back uh, they are more disaster resilient information and media regulation to prepare communities to cope with disaster and it emphasizes on need for iec that is information education and communication activities it calls for ethical guidelines for media of uh, for coverage of disasters as well as self regulation so media role has also been clearly laid out so uh, it wants the media to respect the dignity and privacy of the affected people of disaster so it uh, in a move aim to stop rumors and spread of panic the plan directed the authorities to schedule regular media briefing so that it can reduce the panic among the uh, affected people uh, or their uh, relatives and designate a nodal officer for interacting with media and behalf of government so there will be regular media briefings focus on training capacity building and incorporating best international practices has also been laid out in this plan so we have discussed that this plan was uh, uh, like laid out keeping in mind sindai framework and sdg that is sustainable development goal so i told you that earlier there was a hugo framework hugo is also city in japan sindai is also city in japan uh, 
Japan is 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 most hit by these tsunamis and it's vulnerable to disaster as such. So Sendai framework it's a fifteen year non binding agreement. Remember, it's a non binding agreement on disaster risk reduction. It replaced the earlier Hyogo framework. It was ad- adopted at third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction held at Sendai in Japan in March two thousand fifteen. It aims for sustainable reduction of disaster risk and losses in life, livelihoods, and health. in the economic physical social cultural and environment assets of person business communities and country so again it's a very comprehensive uh, uh, framework and it has replaced the yogo framework so it's a 15 year non binding agreement on disaster risk reduction now there is another index that is disaster risk index of the world india has been ranked 77th on this world uh, risk index and it is topped by the islands uh, state This is an island in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, uh, so these islands are most vulnerable. Uh, generally, uh, if there is any sea level rise due to climate change or like global warming, these are vulnerable to cyclones and such thing also. So that's why uh, this uh, island uh, has topped this list. About the report, the World Risk Report analyzes the role that infrastructure plays in shaping countries' disaster risk. It is calculated by University of Stuttgart. Stuttgart is a place in Germany. It ranks 171 countries according to their risk of becoming a victim of disaster as a result of natural hazards. So this is disaster risk index of world. So India, you can see, ranks 77. China 85. Nepal 108. Pakistan 72. Sri Lanka 63. And Bangladesh five. Uh, okay. So again, ba- Bangladesh is more vulnerable to disaster. then a workshop on preparation of wheat wave action plan now this is very important for this year prelims uh, ndma that's the main authority for disaster management in india and government of telangana they organized a workshop on preparation of heat wave action plan to mitigate the impact of heat wave in 2017 now what questions can be asked from this is what are heat waves and what is the criteria for heat wave that is very important the criteria is very important so what are heat waves this, this is a period of abnormally uh, high temperatures more more than the normal maximum temperature during summer month so it is predominantly prevalent in northwestern parts of india during march and june in some part it extends up to july so it's mainly in the march april may june uh, these uh, heat waves are prominent in the especially in the northern parts of india um, then what's the criteria for heat wave so imd indian meteorological department it has laid down the following criteria so heat wave is not to be considered till the temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degree in plains and 30 degree in hilly areas so remember 40 in plains and 30 in hilly areas second when normal maximum temperature of a station is less than or equal to 40 So, if the normal te- temperature is less than forty, then a departure of five to six degree from the normal will be considered as heat wave. Suppose the temperature, normal temperature, is somewhere around thirty, uh, and if there is a departure of five to six degree, so if uh, suppose it, it it becomes thirty seven degree, right, or thirty six degree, it will be considered to be a heat wave. While a departure of seven degree will be considered to be a severe heat wave. So, if it will be thirty seven degree, it will be considered as a severe heat wave. When normal maximum temperature of a station is more Then forty, then a departure of only four to five will be considered to be heat wave. Suppose uh, the normal maximum temperature of a place is forty two, and then a departure of four or five will uh, will be considered as a heat wave. Say forty six degree Celsius, the temperature is there. Then uh, uh, so uh, it will be considered as a heat wave. While a departure of six six degree will be considered as severe heat wave. in case the normal temperature of a station is more than 45 degree celsius then in any case it will be declared as heat wave irrespective of any criteria so if the temperature of a station is more than 45 then it will be considered as a heat wave heat wave it leads to dehydration it leads to stress it leads to heat exhaustion and sometimes it may also lead to a fatal heat stroke so ndma it has released guidelines for preparation of action plan prevention and management of heat wave so the this is uh, what can be asked in uh, prelims that is the criteria for heat wave remember these terms it is 40 degree in plains 30 in uh, hilly regions if it is more than 45 then in respect of any criteria it would be considered as a heat wave if the normal temperature is less than 40 then 5 to 6 departure will be considered as a heat wave and 7 degrees departure will be considered as a severe heat wave if it is more than 40 degree celsius then a departure of even a 4 to 5 degree will be considered as a heat wave and a departure of 6 will be considered as severe heat wave so this is about heat wave 
then uh, samudra pehredar uh, sri lanka and india remember these two countries who have uh, held a joint oil spill prevention exercise on board the indian coast guard ship samudra pehredar so uh, both india and sri, uh, sri lanka they are located close to the busiest network of international shipping lanes so that's why this area is vulnerable to oil spill and that is why there was a joint oil spill prevention exercise that is uh, between india and sri lanka it was on board the indian coast guard ship samudra pehredar so oil spill from vessels that occur as a result of collisions with oil platforms and various other related reasons it has posed a significant threat on marine environment so that's why this joint oil spill prevention exercise was there between india and sri lanka now there's another exercise is jal rahat exercise it's a joint initiative taken by assam government and armed forces towards the objective of improving disaster preparedness during flood so assam is a state that is annually hit by floods uh, that is caused by brahmaputra river so this jal rahat exercise it's a joint initiative of assam state government and armed forces to improve the disaster preparedness okay uh, similar exercise like in visakhapatnam by indian navy exercise prakam uh, prakampan for preparedness in case of super cyclone in bhuj gujarat by indian air force exercise sahayat uh, for major earthquake so this is the jal rahat exercise and here you can see um like uh, it was in the assam mainly for disaster uh, preparedness with respect to uh, floods then prakampan that that that's what i have already discussed that uh, it was a joint disaster management exercise named prakampan that is mainly for uh, cyclone it was held in visakhapatnam and mainly to synchronize resources and efforts of all agencies involved in disaster management so it was conducted by eastern naval command in liaison with concerned center and state authorities so capabilities demonstrated during exercise of that is a prakampan exercise so remember jal rahat exercise prakampan exercise okay then now let's discuss all the miscellaneous uh, issues of environment so one is related to urban heat island so a new climate model to study the heat island effect in abu dhabi has been developed by researchers now this model uh, once completed would help in tackling the effects across the globe so now the question that can be asked in prelims is what is an urban heat island you might have already studied it so it is defined as the rise in temperature of any man made area resulting in a well defined distinct warm island among the cool sea represented by lower temperature of areas nearby natural landscape so how does it what does it mean this is the heat island and the temperature in this area is relatively warmer as compared to the cool sea cool sea here doesn't mean that there is a water body it means that in the neighborhood region the temperature is relatively low as compared to the uh, this region so this is a uh, distinct heat island okay you can see it here in the downtown the the temperature is high and in the rural area the temperature is low so this is the concept of heat island though heat islands may uh, may form on any rural or urban area but cities are generally the favorable areas where this heat island are or uh, where uh, these cities are more prone to uh, this heat island because they release large quantities of heat on an average the annual air temperature of heat island in a city with 1 million people or people or more can be 1 to 3 degrees celsius celsius warmer than its surroundings which go up to 12 degrees celsius in evenings heat islands can affect communities by increasing the summer time energy demand there will be more demand of air condition so that uh, in that sense cost of energy and uh, energy demand will increase air pollution greenhouse gas emission heat related illness and morta mortality so these are the effects of urban heat island major causes of this heat island are vehicular emission dark pavement that absorb more of sunlight multi story buildings and air condition among these the use of acs is most adverse as it creates a vicious cycle so as such uh, these are the main causes of urban heat island the effect of heat island can be reduced by developing efficient cooling system adding vegetation to buildings using more of green buildings constructing more of green buildings cooling paved surface with reflective planes so increase the albedo of that particular area okay so less of sunlight will be uh, absorbed so this is the concept of urban heat island now there is another news that is hakki habba it's a 3 day bird festival which was held at uh, daroji sloth beer century uh, near world famous hampi hampi is in kerala uh, sorry karnataka Hem hampi is in bellari district uh, in karnataka it was a third edition jointly organized by states forest department and eco tourism board in association with local bird wa bird watchers association so the first two editions were held in uh, rangantitu bird century and kali tiger reserves uh, 
the objective of this festival was to create awareness among the people about conservation of birds so birds like great indian bustard bar headed geese partridges painted sand uh, grouse yellow throated bulbul great horned owl black storks these were sighted along the banks of river tungabhadra in hampi so remember this is a three day bird festival it was held in karnataka and this year it was held in daroji uh, sloth bear sanctuary so these are the sloth bears these are species that are found in india nepal and sri lanka it's a nocturnal animal okay locally it is known as karadi lives in open scrub forest having outcrops of rocks boulders and caves as shelter so you can see outcrop of rocks uh, boulders and caves as shelter they have poor vision and hearing but good sense of smell so that's important daroji century established in 1994 is big, biggest sloth bear century in asia and in asia these sloth bears are found mainly in india nepal and in sri lanka they are listed as vulnerable uh, li they are listed in the vulnerable category in iuc in red data list and in sites they are included in appendix 1 plus in schedule 1 of wildlife protection act so they are given the highest uh, protection that is uh, in schedule 1 the species are given the highest protection okay then it was in news that is polar chira wetlands recently 27th uh, annual wa uh, waterfall census was conducted in the polar chira wetlands in kollam in kerala this year 15 eurasian spoon wills were uh, sighted at polar chira these are migratory birds they are breeding from uk spain in the west and uh, through to go in japan so they they will go, uh, they are migrating from uk and spain they they come in india and then they go in uh, japan so wetland this polachira wetland is a breeding ground for migratory birds from all across the world some of the birds that are sighted here are comb ducks black headed ibis painted storks glossy ibis uh, indian moorhen so these are all the species that are found uh, these migratory species that come in this polachira wetland so in this the the important thing is that 27th annual waterfowl census was conducted in this and this wetland is in kollam district in kerala now this was also a news that is rip tide so isro in collaboration with a lifeguard agency appointed by government goa government is studied uh, conducted a study that is ripex so uh, this was on rip tides along the beaches of goa so what are rip tides this is important this year rip tides these are also known as ebb jet or tidal jet these are powerful currents running perpendicular to shore so if you see th this is the shore and they are running perpendicular to shore okay this is the shore they are running perpendicular to shore okay and they pull the water out into the ocean so as you can see in the diagram they are pulling the water here we have the ocean here we have the shore so they are pulling the water they are pulling you can see it here they are pulling the water out into the uh, ocean and these are very dangerous so the term rip tide is a misnomer as tides occur due to moon's gravitational pull while rip currents are caused due to shape of shoreline so remember rip tides are not caused due to moon's gravitational moons and sun's gravitational pull they are caused due to the configuration of the shape line or due to a formation of a sand bar near the coastline these currents may extend 200 to 2500 feet lengthwise and less than 30 feet in width these are dangerous because they catch swimmers unaware and they pull them deep into the ocean so if a swimmer is here then these currents these rip tides they will eventually pull the swimmers deep into the ocean so these are very dangerous okay you can see a sand bar here and that's how this uh, and these are rip tides they will pull out towards the ocean they pull they will pull out the swimmer towards the ocean so these are perpendicular to the shoreline okay so these are the currents so this is rip tide remember they are not due to uh, gravitational uh, pull of sun and moon these are powerful currents of water moving away from the shore they can sweep away even the strongest swimmer out to the sea so these are very dangerous then uh, efficient and sustainable city bus service project this was there uh, india has signed a dollar 9.2 million grant agreement with world bank for efficient and sustainable city bus service project which was aimed at improving the efficiency of transport and reduce ghg so it will be uh, classified under global environment facility grant with ibrd ibrd is a wing of world bank in in an international bank for reconstruction and development it will be the implementing agency so what's the project about the project has been designed specific to specifically focus on identifying institutional regulatory and fiscal constraint to operation of sustainable city bus service project will complement union government bus funding scheme 
which was launched to promote public transport in cities by modernizing their bus service so it will actually introduce modern uh, info uh, this uh, modern management information system and intelligence system transport system for better planning and management of operation it will also include uh, technical support to drivers plus vehicles for better fuel efficiency so this was um, efficient and sustainable city bus service project where world bank is uh, providing funds now this is shalesh nayak committee this was also in news so we will discuss the whole coastal regulation zone in detail now the report of the committee that is to review the issues related to coastal regulation zone 2011 now what are these coastal regulation zone let's discuss them coastal regulation zone and island protection zone so this one is coastal regulation zone other is island protection zone notification 2011 so india they have nine coastal states uh, four co uh, coastal union territories and the total coastline that is total coastline including the mainland plus the island that is 7517 km okay so this is the total coastline of india now what are these coastal regulation zone that is uh, notification 2011 so many amendments were made to crz notification 1991 and all these amendments were consolidated into crz notification 2011 2011 notification it takes into account and address all the 19 all the issues related to this uh, crz notification 1991 so what are the main objectives of this uh, crz 2011 one is to conserve and protect coastal stretches to ensure livelihood security to fishing and local communities to promote development in a sustainable manner that is based on scientific principles and that takes into account natural hazards and sea level rise so let's discuss the crz limit now this can be asked in prelims 2017 one is uh, this this one is the territorial sea right uh, here we are that that we'll discuss uh, separately when uh, after the crz we'll discuss the unclos uh, maritime zone so this uh, 12 nautical miles 24 nautical miles uh, all this we'll uh, discuss separately first let's uh, discuss crz limit so here this is the low tide line you can see it here this the water here will go when there is a high tide so this is a high tide line this is a low tide line this is a 200 meter line from the high tide line this is a 500 meter line from the high tide line so what does these mean these are actually coastal regulation zone limits okay so if you see again you can uh, we'll first discuss uh, these uh, uh, zones and then we'll uh, discuss the diagram so crz1 that is in this you will include ecologically sensitive areas like mangroves coral reefs biosphere reserves these are very uh, sensitive ecosystems so uh, these ecologically sensitive areas will will be covered under crz1 then in crz2 built up area that is villages and towns that are already well established now you cannot remove them so that will be there in crz2 crz3 includes rural and urban areas that are not substantially developed and crz4 include water areas up to the territorial waters and the tidal influenced water body so let's discuss all these crz 1 2 3 4 category and then there is a separate draft that is island protection zone notification that we'll discuss separately that is for protection of islands of andaman nicobar and lakshadweep that is under environment protection act 1986 so let's discuss each of the category now as i have told you in crz1 category ecologically sensitive areas are included like mangroves corals coral reefs sand dunes mud flats which are biologically active so this provides uh, this actually sustains uh, biodiversity national parks and other protected areas including biosphere reserves encompassing salt marshes turtle nesting grounds horseshoe crabs habitat sea grass beds um, uh, then a uh, nesting ground of birds areas of structures of archaeological importance and heritage sites and then the area between low tide line and high tide line so this is the part that comes under crz1 so this is the ecologically sensitive zone plus the low tide line and high tide line area this comes under crz1 so you can see coral reefs seaweeds creeks horseshoe crab habitats turtle nesting sites uh, this zone between uh, this low tide line and high tide line all this comes under crz1 category then activities permissible under crz1 no new construction will be permitted in crz1 except projects relating to department of atomic energy construction of trans harbor ceiling and roads without affecting the tidal flow of water between the low tide line and high tide line now this is the no new construction in the uh, in this crz1 uh, except these two 
plus between the low tide line and high tide line in areas which are not ecologically sensitive following thing can be permitted so exploration and extraction of natural gas construction of basic amenities like schools roads uh, salt harvesting by solar evaporation of sea water desalination desalination plants storage of non hazardous cargo such as edible oil fertilizers within the notified port so remember these are the activities that are permissible these are permit permissible between low tide and high tide which are not ecologically sensitive and here these two uh, uh, like activities are permitted then let's discuss crz two category so areas which are developed up to the shoreline and falling within the municipal limits uh, that comes under uh, crz two category so activities are permissible in this uh, category includes buildings are permissible on the landward side of the hazardous line so this is if this hazardous line here we have see here we have land so landward side of hazard hazardous line buildings are permissible other activities such as desalination plants are also permissible some construction is permitted only as per guidelines specified by the notification so proper guidelines have been laid out in this notification so you can see uh, this will be the built up area already the uh, the area that the, this construction is already there okay so that comes under the crz2 category okay now crz3 category areas that are relatively undisturbed and those which do not belong to either crz1 or 2 which include coastal zone in rural areas it may be developed or it may be undeveloped and also areas within municipal limits or in other legally designated urban areas which are not substantially built up okay which are not substantially built up so that uh, comes under crz3 so if you see uh, here we will have ecological sensitive zone then high tide and low tide line this this comes under crz1 right then there will be a crz2 so from htl that is high tide line to 200 meter this is the high tide line then from htl to 200 meter ports and harbors repairs and construction of houses of local people uh, project development atomic energy salt manufacturers non conventional energy petroleum oil uh, lubricant storage weather radar so these these are permitted now from 200 to 500 meter so this is 200 line this is 500 meter hotels and resorts with 9 meter height uh, this uh, this this uh, these are permitted so this is the this 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 is that zone crz3 okay then activities which are permissible in crz3 areas up to 200 meters from htl on landward side in case of sea front and 100 meters along tidal uh, influence water bodies or creeks whichever is less is to be earmarked as no development zone so there will be a no development zone that will be area up to 200 meters from high tide line on the landward side right and in no development zone no construction shall be permitted only certain activities like agriculture forestry projects of department of atomic energy mineral of rare minerals salt manufacturing such things will only be permitted but it may be permanent and that has to be after proper approval now between 200 to 500 meters of high tide line those permitted in 0 to 200 meter zone plus construction of houses for local committees and tourism projects are permitted so if you see within 200 meters what all will be permitted that is for, uh, um, uh, this region and then if you see between 200 and 500 meters so between 200 and 500 meters in this zone uh, what all will be permitted so here in this zone tourism uh, projects like hotels restaurants that are permitted in fact you can see this here okay uh, CRZ 4 category that is the last category the water area from the low tide line to 12 nautical miles on the seaward side so if it is low tide line uh, then up to 12 nautical miles to the sea towards the seaward side it shall include the water area of tidal influence water body from the mouth of water body at the sea upon the influence of tide now uh, in this case water activities are permissible there is no restriction on traditional fishing undertaken by local committees so if local committee are going for fishing in this area then there is no restriction no untreated sewage or solid waste shall be left off or dumped so if if uh, because that can affect the marine ecosystem so no untreated sewage or solid waste will be allowed but there is no restriction on uh, this uh, traditional fishing okay so if you see this low tide line then up to 12 nautical miles this will be uh, that is uh, this will be the crz4 category then crz5 category areas requiring special consideration for the purpose of protecting the critical coastal environment and difficulties faced by local community so crz area falling within municipal limits of greater mumbai crz areas of kerala including backwaters and backwater islands crz areas of goa so these are the, those areas that require special consideration 
right uh, for because they are critical coastal environment then critically vulnerable coastal areas such as sundarbans regions other ecologically sensitive areas that are identified under identified under environment protection area uh, environment protection act so these are included in the crz 5 category this is a separate category uh, for those areas that require special consideration because they are uh, already they are facing difficulties the local communities are facing difficulty or either these are uh, critical coastal environment so what are the measures that are included in the crz uh, 2 2011 to combat pollution that is all coastal states are required to ensure that existing practice of discharging untreated waste plus effluent is phased out within a period of uh, roughly uh, not exceeding two years then dumping of solid waste is phased out within one year an action plan will be prepared for dealing with pollution in coastal areas in a time bound manner and this plan will be submitted to MOEF so MOEF will provide technical and financial assistance now special distance dispension given to ecologically sensitive areas like these areas i've already told you sundarbans gulf of kambad gulf of kutch uh, these areas some areas are included uh, which are declared as critically vulnerable coastal areas and integrated management plan will be prepared for each of these because these are critical habitats they 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 might provide uh, provide uh, they might su support a huge biodiversity or they may be threatened as such so beaches such as uh, these in goa have been desi designated as turtle nesting sites and protected under wildlife protection act so no development activities are permitted in these areas so mainly to protect the uh, uh, the ecosystem plus the uh, because it's a habitat of uh, endangered species so that's why special consideration have been given to such ecologically sensitive areas now apart from coastal regulation zone i had told you this is crz and the other one is ipz that is um, island uh, protection zone so there are about 500 islands in andaman and nicobar and about 30 in lakshadweep so in this uh, in this uh, in this island there is a separate notification that is being issued which takes into account the management of uh, entire island that is except for four islands of andaman nicobar that is north andaman it, it it includes north andaman middle andaman south andaman and great nicobar objectives of the ipz uh, notification uh, the main uh, the objectives are same as the objectives of crz 2011 so what is the uh, criteria that is one two three four how they are defined in the uh, island protection zone so island coastal regulation zone see for island it is different and for the other coastal areas like that, that is uh, in the mainland area the crz is applicable in the island area especially in the andaman nicobar and lakshadweep this ipz is applicable so these areas that are ecologically sensitive and geomorphic uh, geomorphological features play a role in maintaining the integrity of coast plus the area between low tide line and high tide line so this is same as crz1 in crz1 also we are discussed ecologically sensitive area like coral reefs mangroves plus the area between low tide line and high tide line in the uh, in the icrz2 the areas that have been developed up to or close to the shoreline so the area that have been already developed same as crz2 icrz3 areas that are relatively undisturbed and those which do not belong to icrz1 and also areas within municipal li limits or in other legally designated urban areas which are not substantially built up so this is again same as crz3 right then I icrz4 the water area from low tide line to 12 nautical miles on the seaward side it includes the water area of tidal influence water bodies from the mouth of water body at the sea up to the influence of tide so this is also same as crz4 okay then there is the concept of maritime zone since we are discussing the coastal areas we'll discuss the territorial sea contiguous zone then exclusive economic zone right then this whole is the continental shelf then uh, beyond this exclusive economic zone there is high sea okay so let's briefly discuss this so one is from the baseline there is a baseline there uh, from the baseline up to 12 nautical miles we have territorial sea so this was the uh, coastal regulation zone 4 also right then from 12 nautical miles to 24 nautical miles that is from 12 nautical miles uh, from 0 to 24 or we can say from this territorial sea another 12 nautical miles if we take or from that baseline if there is 24 nautical miles this is the contiguous zone okay then uh, from here to 200 nautical miles from the baseline to 200 nautical miles is the exclusive economic zone so here exclusive economic zones these are mainly meant for uh, uh, like claiming rights for exploring uh, or exploiting the reserves uh, reserves can be resources or reserves can be mineral reserves it can be biotech reserves etc 
okay and if you see the whole ocean bed it's like continental shelf here then this slope this is continental slope then there is a continental rise where all the uh, deposits are accumulated so up to here we have continental uh, plate and then the oceanic plate starts so this is the abyssal plain that is the deep ocean plain okay so uh, as i told you beyond 200 na nautical mile we have the high seas so no country can claim right over high seas so remember ter territorial sea then contiguous zone then exclusive economic zone okay uh, this is again this is the baseline you can see within the baseline this will be internal waters then we have territorial waters up to 12 nautical mile then 24 nautical mile contiguous zone and an exclusive economic zone and then beyond exclusive econ economic zone we have the high sea this is again the same uh, here with respect to airspace you can see up up to 12 nautical miles there is the national air, airspace beyond 12, uh, 12 nautical miles we have international airspace okay then there is another news that is internal internal carbon price uh, mahindra mahindra uh, became the first indian firm to announce an internal carbon price of dollar 10 per ton of carbon emitted so what is this internal carbon price it is internationally recognized business tool that enable companies to create resources which are invested in low carbon technologies so mainly they are investing in low carbon technologies and these low carbon technology will definitely help in reducing emissions and lower operating cost so uh, it will uh, help in accelerating innovation and will drive out investment in energy efficient and renewable technologies taking advantage of low carbon investment opportunities while managing the carbon risk some of the global companies that have announced this carbon pricing concept are unilever microsoft google etc and in india mahindra and mahindra became the first indian firm to announce this internal carbon price right so uh, this uh, internal carbon price it's a cost applied to carbon pollution to encourage polluters to reduce the amount of ghg that they have emitted into the atmosphere there are main uh, two types of carbon pricing one is emission trading system and the other one is carbon tax so emission trading system it re it is refers to a, it is referred to as cap and trade system because every organization uh, there will be a capping on the total level of ghg that they can emit right and those uh, industries which will emit less than the total capping they can trade uh their extra uh, uh like uh, certificates okay uh or they can trade their extra units then a carbon tax is uh, directly it sets a price on the carbon by defining a tax rate on greenhouse gas emission or more commonly on the carbon content so it's actually a direct tax a uh, emission trading is mainly a cap and trade mechanism every organization has a capping uh, uh, up to which they can uh, they can uh, uh, they can release greenhouse gas emission Uh, and if they do it less than that then they can uh, trade in the extra units that they have earned india's only active volcano now recently barren island which is the only active volcano along the volcanic chain from sumatra to myanmar uh, that is the only active volcano in india right there is an extinct volcano in india that is narkondam island that is also in uh, andaman nicobar region and there is a active volcano that is barren island that is also in the andaman nicobar region so this recently this barren uh, island it had erupted so barren volcano volcanic island it has erupted so that's why it was in news so it's a submerged uh, submarine emergent volcano which lies above the subduction zone of indian plate and burmese plate this island is uninhabited and devoid of any significant vegetation and wildlife so this is the barren island in andaman nicobar other volcanoes in india there is a doshi hill that's an extinct volcano in northwest part of aravalli range in haryana then there are extinct volcano in kutch district of gujarat as well narkondam island that i have told you it's a volcanic island it's also uh, it's it's, it's uh, it is uh, as such it said that it's extinct volcano but it has been classified as dormant volcano by G gsi the island is listed under unesco world heritage site and famous for endemic narkondam hornbill this is very important so endemic narkondam hornbill hornbill uh, hornbill is found in this Uh, narkondam island baratang island in andaman is famous for mud volcanoes so these are uh, important uh, volcanoes extinct dormant active right and baran is the only active volcano now this was also in news that is swalbard global seed vault so uh, this some 5 50000 new samples from seed collections around the world including india they have been deposited in this swalbard global seed vault so it looks like this 
so uh, this uh, is uh, uh, it's it's owned and administered by ministry of agriculture and food on behalf of kingdom of norway it's a gene bank built underground on the isolated island in a permafrost zone some 1000 kilometers from north pole so it will it was opened in 2008 to act as a backup to world's other seed banks in case their deposits are lost so why it is in the arctic region because the, the, that is a permafrost zone and uh, these seeds uh, these genes can survive in that area so it's a world largest repository built to safeguard against wars on natural disaster wiping out global food crops so this is about small bird global seed vault okay now uh, this was also news uh, that's a small news that is uh, norway becomes first country to ban deforestation this was uh, this would have huge impact on global deforestation so which is the country that has become first that's the first country to ban deforestation that is norway it is also committed to find alternatives to palm oil soya beef and wood products which contributes to a little less than half of total tropical deforestation so they are finding alternatives and uh, that should uh, reduce deforestation okay then international solar alliance this was a news uh, because uh, former secretary of renewable energy minister uh, he has been re recently appointed as the interim director general of international solar alliance now what is this this is an alliance of more than 120 now these countries are uh, those country that lie between tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn that is these are sunshine countries or these are tropical countries that lies between tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn so this agreement was uh, signed up during the conference of party uh, 2022 this was open for signing but as such it was uh, uh, this uh, agreement uh, this international solar alliance it was uh, uh, first initiated by india and france during the cop 21 that is in paris okay and it was opened up for signing uh, at the cop 22 at marrakesh uh, in november last year and 25 country last year that is in 2016 and 25 countries have joined it assembly will meet after 15 of these de designate trees ratify the international solar alliance it has a um, assembly a council and a secretariat indian government uh, will support the secretariat for 5 years after which it has to generate its own resources okay and the secretariat has been set up at the national institute of solar energy in gurgaon so this uh, this uh, this institute will collaborate this uh, uh will collaborate with other multilateral bodies such as international energy agency international renewable energy agency and united nation the secretariat has been set up in gurgaon and this is the main uh, uh, like issues uh, this is the main uh, provisions related to international solar alliance then hydroponics uh, this was also news because kerala dairy development board has recently introduced a scheme to produce hydroponic green fodder now hydroponic fodder it will substitute the green fodder and make complete and hay completely as it lacks in fiber content so let's discuss what is hydroponic that can be asked in prelims this means the technique of growing plants without soil or solid growing medium so remember hydroponics as the name suggests hydro so it it's a growing plants without the soil or any solid growing medium but it uses water or nitro or nutrient rich solution only for a short duration so you can see it here in this case if you see yes in this case uh, hydroponics using the nutrient film technique so this this is the solution which has the nutrient rich uh, water okay so the plants they are actually absorbing the 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 plant roots they are absorbing the flowing nutrient enriched water okay and this nutrient enriched water it is circulated it keeps on circulating so this is how uh, the plants they are grown without uh, soil or solid growing medium but they use water as such they are using nutrient enriched water and this nutrient enriched water it keeps on circulating so this is hydroponics technique and kerala dairy development board has recently introduced a scheme to produce hydroponic green fodder okay then ganga and yamuna rivers they were designated as living entity recently uttarakhand high court has recognized the ganga and yamuna rivers as living entity it is was the first time in in india that any court has recognized a non human thing as a legal, uh, living entity and that is mainly for protecting the recognition and faith of society so Uh, the director namami gange project and chief secretary and the advocate general of uttarakhand they have been charged to protect conserve and preserve the rivers plus their tributaries so in india animals for in instance they aren't considered living entities by law 
only humans are considered but recognizing these rivers as a living entity it actually grants them new legal entity and all rights laid out in the constitution of india and these people are in charge they have been charged to protect conserve and preserve the rivers so director namami gange project chief secretary and the advocate general of uttarakhand so these uh, now these rivers have the right to be legally protected and not be harmed and destroyed so mainly for the conservation of these rivers that is ganga and yamuna this step has been taken by uttarakhand high court it also means that if someone pollutes these river the law will see it equal as harming a human being so that's why they have been considered as a living entity earlier in march 2017 new zealand it was the first country that declared wanganui river as legal person making it the first river in the world to get this status and after that in india we have given ganga and yamuna river as the this uh, this status of a living entity and now this is the last news that is genetic garden of halophytes the world's first genetic garden of halophytes it was inaugurated in vedar nayam uh, in tamil nadu and this has been set up by ms swaminathan foundation research and halophytes what are halophytes like uh, mangroves they are halophytes these are salt tolerant or salt resistant species they can thrive and complete their life cycles in soil or water containing high salt concentration such as saline semi deserts mangrove sw- swamps marshes sloughs and seashores they constitute 2% of all the plant species so remember what are halophytes mangrove is one of them and this world uh, first genetic garden of halophytes uh, it has been inaugurated in tamil nadu so that's all about environment we have discussed uh, environment in detail all the current affairs of last one year uh, in total i have taken p- uh, five parts of environment current affairs series and i would suggest you to watch all these five uh, five parts uh, thank you